Hello, and welcome to Zion Lutheran Church, Maryland Heights, online, Maundy Thursday edition. It's called Maundy Thursday. This is the anniversary of the Lord's Supper and also the anniversary of the last that night of Jesus' life. Uh, it's uh, an opportunity for us to look at all sorts of wonderful things that Jesus did on sort of like the time when most people do it in his last meal. We're not going to be focusing on that because the last meal is the Lord's Supper. Instead, we're going to look at the Maundy part, which is this command. It's a Latin word for this command that Jesus gave his disciples to love one another. And because they own their faith, they were there to hear Jesus uh, say that and see Jesus show that to them. So it's our hope and our, our privilege to lay the word of God before you, even if we are in a little bit of an exile, with our Maundy Thursday service. With that, the Lord be with you. The gifts of God come to us today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins, asking God our Father, for the sake of his Son, Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But, but I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, 
a poor sinful being. Led by the Holy Spirit, as a called and ordained servant of Jesus Christ, and at the will and to the delights of the Father, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God himself sanctify you completely, and may your entire soul and body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Since this is the anniversary of the night before Jesus is put on the cross, we get an opportunity to see how he spends his last 24 hours. And at the beginning of the night, they're about to have a festival, a feast of the Passover, and Jesus does this. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, uh, not my feet only, but, but also my, my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garment and resumed his place, he said to them, do you not understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to have washed one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking to all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he had spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, Judas immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me. Just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. 
A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me already three times. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, who allows us to own the faith in wonderful, wonderful ways. Amen. Throughout all of Lent, right, we're on the final lap now, throughout all of Lent we have been looking at people that have taken ownership of their faith and people who didn't. People who didn't take ownership of their faith, as we looked at people like Solomon, uh, those people miss out on tremendous opportunities. But the people who did take ownership of their faith, that didn't just socially go to church or socially be a Christian or socially wear a cross, but people who took ownership of their faith did wonderful things like go to worship, pray to God, spend time in the Bible, listen up when, when people were reading the Bible, and, and they heard the voices of other people when they cried out for, for help. Uh, they heard those as invitations from God to get involved in that person's life. That's what owning the faith looks like. Tonight, we get a special opportunity to see a group of 11 out of 12 who really owned their faith. And as a result, were there at Jesus' Last Supper, at the Lord's Supper, which we celebrate at communion. Later on, they would get Jesus' body and blood in this amazing way that the church has been allowed by God to continue to lay before one another. But Maundy Thursday is because this Maundy means the Latin word mandatum, which means a new command. And Jesus gives this new command. He says in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, this is like the platinum rule, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And this is how people will know that you're with me, because you love people. These 11, Judas obviously had excused himself from being a part of the ownership of the faith, but the 11 that were there, they were washed by Jesus. This is the only baptism that I know of, that history has ever recorded, that I, of which I'm aware, that was on the feet. When people are baptized, they're either baptized by fully immersing their bodies, we call that dunking, or, or whether someone just gets water poured on their head, we call that pouring, or someone gets water sprinkled on their head, which is a lot more rare, but we call that sprinkling. When people are baptized, it always includes the forehead, right? Whether it's the whole body or just the head, but these, these 12, they're baptized by Jesus on the feet. And in that beautiful way that they were baptized, in that beautiful way that they were baptized, Jesus tells Peter and all of us, if you have been washed with baptism, if you have been washed by the water of God, you have a share with Jesus. And he has a share with you. These disciples held on. They took their ownership of the faith seriously. When Jesus said, we're going to go to Cana, they went to Cana. When Jesus said, we're going to go to Bethlehem, which is probably not all that common, if ever, uh, they went wherever he wanted to go. When he said, we're going to go to Jerusalem, some of them said, we're going to die if we go to Jerusalem, but Jesus, we're with you. And because they took the ownership of their faith seriously, they got the amazing last evening with Jesus. And in that evening, they got their sins washed away. In that evening, they got the Lord's Supper. In that evening, they got the opportunity to pray with Jesus one last time. In that evening, they got the opportunity to be there in the Garden of Gethsemane, which would not have been a wonderful experience, but they were there with Jesus praying to his last before he was arrested. They were there to be able to bear witness to us in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all the witnesses that they looked into and all the witnesses that they found. They got to be there to say... Uh, unanimously that Jesus is 100% in it to take care of us. Not once did Jesus say, I'm not sure about this. Not once did Jesus say, you're not worth it. Not once did Jesus say, you know, it's getting a little too real right now. 
because God is in it for you. Sometimes we can feel that the whole world is against us. Sometimes we can look at our life situation, we could say, well, if God was for me, I'd have more money. If God was for me, my wife would be better, my husband would be better, my kids would be better, my parents would be better. If God was for me, my phone would be nicer, or I wouldn't have to have chemotherapy. If God were for me, then my car wouldn't break down, or I'd still have a job. If God were for me, then COVID-19 the COVID wouldn't be ravaging the world. If God was for me, if God was for me, if God was for me. But here, they took their faith seriously, and they owned it. And as a result, they could say, to the very last moment, Jesus is for you. Can you imagine the, the hell that unfolded the rest, of the, the rest of their time together with Jesus? They saw him smacked around. They saw him flogged. They saw him hurt. They saw him betrayed. They saw Judas lead that group of soldiers back. They heard that rooster crow. They were living a nightmare. But because they took ownership of their faith, they knew God more than all the people who stayed at home that evening. They knew Jesus better than all the people who were too busy doing anything else, too busy playing video games or going for walks or, or napping or sleeping in or going to bed early, too busy gossiping. All the other rest of the world was too busy to spend this evening with Jesus. And Jesus blessed those who were with him. And they got the opportunity throughout the rest of the life, when Peter does lay down his life, to know that God is for him. God is for you. He's for you whether it feels good or it doesn't. He's for you. And the more you take ownership of your faith, the more you hear these words, the more you're hearing it in worship, the more you're hearing it when we're in church or online church, the more you're reading it when you're taking a peek at the Bible, and the more you take it to heart. And the less the less that world has an opportunity to chip away at your confidence because you're with Jesus and you know he is with you. Over the next few minutes throughout Lent, we've been inviting each other to take a few minutes together each day to have a conversation with God. I would invite you to, in your next few minutes, we're going to have Dr. Laverty play a beautiful piece and lay that before you. Uh, in those times, in those moments, I would encourage you to have an honest conversation with God. Ask him to wash away your fears, wash away your excuses, and allow you to take ownership of your faith so that you can do what Jesus has stationed us to do. Love those around us as he has loved us. Jesus, sometimes we are in the position of Judas doing the wrong thing. Sometimes we're in the position of Peter thinking too much of ourselves. Sometimes we are in the position of the other apostles like Matthew or Thomas, not quite sure what to think, not quite sure what to say, and just hang back. We pray that you'd watch over us and grant that we would hear your invitation to be closer with you anew, that we'd be excited, that we'd want to be closer to you. Because, Lord, that is where home is, and that's where eternity is. And that's where our peace of mind right now is. You know our excuses. You know they're not good enough. So not only do we ask you to save us from our sins, 
but save us from our excuses, save us from ourselves as well. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us online, even if we are in a little bit of an exile. Unfortunately, because we're a church in exile at this time, the whole church is, the, things, are, things are struggling. We would invite you to consider us in your, uh, in your donations and your contributions. If you do not have an income at this time, there is no expectation whatsoever because you're just trying to make ends meet. But if you do have a secure income or you do have a secure pension, we would invite you to be extra thoughtful at how you can help us support the kingdom of God, paying for these videos at this time, the, the website, our bandwidth, everything that goes into showing love to the people around us. You can obviously drop off a check or you can mail it to us here at our address. Uh, another way that you can give is you can go to our website where you found this video likely and click on that PayPal donate button. Uh, but if you just want to get it done right away, real quick, you can just wave your phone over our QR code over here, and it'll take you right to it. We've got a great uh, deal worked out with PayPal. Anything that you contribute to the kingdom of God through Zion or any church is going to go to bringing this word to people whose lives are completely upside down. And so we thank you. We thank you ahead of time for how you are going to join with us and partner with the kingdom of God. Because we struggle, Lord, even though we should not, we ask... Lord Jesus, please have mercy on us. Because you have done far too much for us to even doubt you, we ask that you would please, Lord Jesus, please have mercy on us. Because we do not love the people around us as you, Lord Jesus, deserve, and as you, Lord Jesus, invite us to love, we ask that you would please, Lord Jesus, please have mercy on us. Because this day, too many times in our life, has just flown past us as another day leading up to Easter. And because you have invited us now to be in worship with you and in conversation with you, we ask that you would, Lord Jesus, please have mercy on us. That we would not leave this moment as we were before. That we would be drawn into taking ownership of our faith and in a greater love for you, Lord Jesus. Please have mercy on us. Lord, please remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, because it is Monday Thursday, in the time of Jesus' life, everything was being taken from him. His, his freedom was being taken from him. His, his eventually clothing was taken from him. His innocence was being smeared over with a guilty complaint. Uh, his disciples were taken from him. Everything, everything was taken from him. But what's precious is that it wasn't robbed from him. He willingly allowed them to take it. Today, because it is Monday Thursday, we traditionally strip the altar. And so as we listen to this next song, and as you, think, as you see things slowly disappear, we invite you to consider how in this time in Jesus' life, God emptied himself to fill you with every good thing.
Thank you.